Please like, share, subscribe to Film Companion. Lisa, welcome back to Mumbai. Thank you. And I believe this time it's permanent. You're back for good. I hope so. For for a while at for least. For a while. Yes. <laughs> you moved back with your gorgeous daughters, your husband. Like, yeah. How, how does that feel to be back in the city? Actually, Anu, you're the first person who's asking me this officially. You know, <laughs> because it's been such a whirlwind. We've just been back for a week. And uh, I don't travel lightly anymore. <laughs> I used not. to travel lightly for a long period of my life. So now, you know, coming back with a husband, as you said, two babies, and the babies have their own entourage, of, of course. course. Of course. Um, it's a very different experience. <laughs> and so for me also to, I guess, come back to the city that has really shaped me, that has also been, you know, it, uh, that I do consider home. Yeah. Is uh, it's a very unique experience. I still haven't completely absorbed it, though, to be honest right, yet. Right. Yeah. And congratulations on your memoir on Close to the Bone. Thank uh, you. I felt like it was a very heartfelt account of a life that is in equal parts just flat out fabulous and harrowing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering as I was reading it that how did you decide on how much to include and how much to talk about and how much to keep to yourself? Oh yeah, actually that's a really good question to start. Let, let's start with the like the really easy questions, <laughs> right? Let's just start right there. You know, even I, maybe what I have to do is t take one step further back and say, you know, well, why did I even bother writing a book? You know, and uh, I was approached to write uh, you know, a memoir, as it were, when I announced my cancer diagnosis. And that was way back in 2009. Yeah. And very shortly after I publicly announced my cancer diagnosis, and I think that at that oh, moment, with the I was with, with, the, yellow with, the, with the Yellow Diaries. Yeah. Um, two things had happened. I think I was one of the first sort of Indian personalities to share this kind of yeah. news publicly. And then secondly, I chose to chronicle it also. And the reason I wrote about it in a blog, and I'd never written a blog before, I had no clue. And a blog is not a very attractive sounding name. I wish they would come up with something else, you right, know, because right. it just doesn't even sound a very, diary. yeah, a diary, a diary, yeah. a diary or yeah. chronicles or something like that. Yeah. It was because I think that I've always been a writer and I, you know, I don't yeah. say that lightly. Uh, but I have my way of digesting the world around me and my experiences is actually through words. Mm -hmm. Um, so I've always kept diaries. Uh, I wanted to be a writer since I was really, really young. I'm a bit of an introvert, you know, an observer. I don't really like a lot of attention, mm. which is, of course, why I became an actress, right? <laughs> <laughs> because that's what you do. I, I mean, uh, it's very circumstantial, isn't right. it? And my life has been serendipitous yeah. and, you know, reflecting back on it. Let me also say that it was cancer that put kind of a stop to my constant movement. You know, mm. I was someone who was constantly moving, who was constantly distracting myself, keeping myself busy. And uh, it wasn't until post-cancer that I was able to stop and sort of digest my life mm. and look back and reflect, you know? So it was kind of a perfect storm of circumstances that came together to say, okay, I had this offer to write. I'd always wanted to write. I had the time to write. I, ha I felt I maybe had something to say mm. and I had time to reflect. So I started writing it way back then, but something happened, you know. I wrote it, I wrote sort of a first draft. I wasn't really happy with it. And ironically, I was sort of pressured to publish it. Mm -hmm. Because these days, marketing department often tells us what to do, yeah. right? Yeah. And I was told, well, you must release it in April, and you know, because that's a great time for cancer memoirs or something right. you know, like that. Right. And I still remember submitting the manuscript and then feeling this deep sense of, um, you know, anxiety. And this was which year? When? This was 2010. So okay. very close so right to then. Very close to after I was, you know, late 2010, after right. I was diagnosed. I just knew that something was wrong. And so I listened to that deep inner voice saying, like, no, you don't take the take the memoir back. It this is not the book. And I withdrew it. And I begged my publisher at that time, it was a Canadian publisher. I said, okay, just just give me six months more and you know, I'll rewrite it and I'll do something with it. And then I procrastinated. And then after that, I asked for six months more. And then I asked for six months more. And then I asked for a year more. And believe me, I'm not a procrastinator. Right. You know, right. I am someone when I want to do something, I just set my mind to it and I do it. Yeah. So I couldn't even explain it to myself. Have you ever been in that situation? No. <laughs> But some way you knew it wasn't ready. I just knew and you know this was a kind of project where it was so deeply personal 
I didn't need to do it basically right. also. Right. Either I did it right and in a way that made sense to me or I didn't need to do it, you mm. know. There was no burning requirement for me to put out uh, sure. a book unless it was exactly what I wanted to be. And as I said, it was puzzling almost to myself and a lot of people around me. And then, it, you know, time went on. Finally, literally about a year and a half ago, we had relocated back to Asia because my master devious plan was always to come back to India. <laughs> Via Hong Kong? Uh, via Hong Kong, <laughs> yes. And you know how sometimes you can't break the news to your husband right. directly? Mm. So say, I think we should move back to Asia. I think Hong Kong sounds good. Right. Knowing that eventually we would make our way back to India. But being back in Asia also, and I, I have been in the last four years, obviously, you know, in, in a sense, spending six months of the year here, yeah. and, you know, yeah. back in India and, and doing my thing. That also revived something in me. And then I spent the last year and a half rewriting the entire thing and then decided that, and it felt deeply appropriate that I release it first mm. in India. And I think that also being in India revived a lot of memories and thoughts right. and also intention of why I wanted to tell this story in a certain way. Yeah. And then suddenly, you know, it was like the faucet opened and then it just, it just came out of me. Really? I mean, having said that, obviously, there was like still a lot of editing to be done and everything. I'm pleased with where it is now. Yeah. But going back to your initial question, which was like, how do you decide what to put in the book and what not to put in the book? It was very organic and that's where the editing came in. Mm -hmm. um, but I did decide from the beginning just to be deeply truthful. And fortunately, all these years I've kept diaries and I referred back to them. You know, and uh, somehow or the other, you string together these stories and you get a book. I don't know. It wasn't a very like it wasn't a very academic approach towards right, it. Right, right. You know, um, for me, one of the most fascinating parts of the book was the stories from the early nineties. The little anecdotes. You know, yeah, when, yeah. when you first came to Mumbai, you're 16 years old. Mm -hmm. um, this is people. Of course, it's pre cell phones, but it's also pre the modern celebrity. Machinery. Yes. Yes. You know, yes. Uh, page three did not exist. No. Uh, uh, it, it was just about coming together. It was just mm -hmm. about happening. And you are this stunning half Polish, half Bengali, 16 year old girl who lands yeah. in this crazy city. Which nobody in the beginning realized was 16 because I look so much older. But how so did everyone you even process it. <laughs> I think I'm still processing it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was so serendipitous, but. I always had this deep attraction to India, you know. I mean, we were coming since I was a child. That's one thing I talk about in the book. I was very connected with uh, Kolkata, Calcutta in those days. And there was some inexplicable kind of bug or pull inside me. And it was almost like a message, like one day you will be in India. But I didn't know how to go about it or how that would manifest. And at the same time, I was also like an ordinary kid. In Canada. Know, in Canada, yeah. you yeah. know, growing up and having your adventures and your misadventures. And, you know, and I came from a very academic family. So that was the expectation. You know, nobody in my family had ever done anything as disreputable as actually being photographed in front of a camera, never mind <laughs> in a nunga, you know, bathing suit. <laughs> and in those Tower. days, or a towel. <laughs> or whatever it was. I was always rebellious, but more than rebellious, I was always um, challenging, questioning, let's say. I was a very Why does it have to be like this? Why? It yeah. was just like always a why. And sometimes why also gets you into a lot of problems. Sure. But that was something I never understood. Mm. India happened very, very serendipitously. It happened really, uh, again, a perfect storm of circumstances. I had come to India with my parents very young. I was chaperoned. We uh, had made a plan to rent a flat. In those days, it was very difficult to rent a flat. And so all of our plans fell through and we ended up actually living in the Hare Krishna ashram yeah. in Juhu, which in itself was very bizarre and surreal. But my mother, bless her, was very industrious. She loved India. She herself, being Polish, blonde, blue-eyed, had this very unique relationship with India that my own father did not, because my father left when he was 20, and right. he also used to go harumph. Everything in India is so inefficient. Nothing and works. Nothing yeah. works. Yes, and you know, that I generation know. Yes. of, you know, kind of Bengali babu, correct, you know. Correct. And so my mom just set us up in the Hare Krishna ashram and we were very comfortable and I used to go on these jogs on Juhu Beach and one day somebody stopped me and said, uh, hello, do you want to star in films? 
and I just was, like that just like that literally and it was so out of left field it was so out of the blue that I turned around with a scowl on my face ready to throw sand into this gentleman's face because you know, it was a usual thing. I was a young girl jogging on the beach and sometimes I would get these lecherous stares. Sure. And, but you know, rather than take it lying down, I would grab a handful of sand and I'd throw it in the man's face and continue jogging. And this became a matter of routine. And uh, so I was fully ready to do that. But you know, something about this gentleman made me stop. And he, you know, he did, he had this sort of aura about him, you know, and he wasn't looking at me and, you know, in any sort of a lecherous way. And I said, I never thought about it. I was actually quite speechless. And he says, well, if you ever want to join films, here's my card. And, you know, I took it and I sort of jogged away and I looked down and it said, I still remember Shekhar Kapoor, right. you know, and I went, Shekhar Kapoor, why is that so funny? <laughs> oh, Mr. India. Right. He had just made Mr. Right. India, which at that time, was you know, the was thing. the biggest thing. Of course. I loved it. Yeah. I used to also dance along to the songs. Right. You know, who can forget Sri Devi and that gorgeous blue sari yeah, and everything yeah. like that. And it was just the most terrifying thing that had happened to me to date because I could not conceive being again of my particular nature. As I said, the nature of an observer, someone who was deeply introverted, someone who was very academic, appearing in front of a camera, never. Right. So I kind of, you know, put it down like I filed it in the back of my head like this is an interesting anecdote yeah but let's move on so anyways one thing led to the other and then I ended up actually being asked to model modeling was something I felt like okay because it's can just, do this yeah maybe let me just I was curious again curiosity right. both you know questioning and curiosity have been both my I think my greatest assets and occasionally my downfall right. but you know I own it and uh, so I ended up modeling for Maureen Wadia who called me to her house there's, there's Lisa a great story about you going to her house the first time and her Rottweiler <laughs> biting you on the ass <laughs> When I'm so I glad that, you told this story. <laughs> when I read that, I said, this needs to be in a movie. Like, how do I you... I mean, you can't make that up. You can't make honestly. it up. It, and that's how it happened. And that was the you thing. You just I felt walk like... in and this dog is around. And... So imagine you're being caught. Like, I don't know who is who and what is sure. what. But somebody tells me at a party. Because I got swept along with Bombay. And I always loved Bombay, of course. Right. I'm not saying that I wasn't slept along with the glamour and yeah, sort yeah. Of the party life. Someone said, oh, Maureen would love you. I'm like, oh, who's Maureen and why yeah. would she love me? What right. are you talking about? Right. And I still remember he was like this uh, Parsi. He was a Parsi elder, elderly gentleman who looked like a turtle yeah. in a turtleneck. Yeah. You know, he had one of those faces. He said, ah, Maureen, she likes half-breeds, you know, and she's uh, always looking for models yeah. and you must meet her. Yeah. So somebody set up a meeting. I don't even remember how it happened. I said, okay, cello, I'm curious, let's go. I got into a cab, I couldn't speak very good Hindi, so the cab dropped me off in front of this huge gate. And I didn't know enough to tell me the cab, tell the cab to take me inside. Right. There was a long winding road to navigate. I landed up at her bungalow in mm. uh, Prabha Devi. Mm. So I was walking along and taking everything in and, you know, I rounded a corner and I saw this huge bungalow. As I think I described it in the book as fearlessly sort of horizontal right. because, you know, Bombay is a very vertical city. Yes. So if you can afford to have this huge bungalow, you're, you're definitely, special. you're special. You're a very special person. <laughs> yeah. And I saw Maureen. I still remember my first sighting of her. She was just looked like a, a silent movie star. Yeah. You know, she's extremely beautiful and uh, poised and everything like yeah. that. So, you know, she waved at me and, you know, I didn't, I, I don't know, I always had, I had a connection with her, so I didn't find her intimidating, you didn't find her but her I was just, okay. you know, striking. And in, in right. my head, she is striking. She's very, very striking. Very striking. And yeah. in my head, I was already writing the story about this because right. that's also how, as I said, how I've always um, consumed my life. So anyway, so I round the corner and I see Maureen and I, you know, sort of give her a tentative wave and I continue on my way. And then around the corner, this pack of dogs come running. But, you know, of course, there's there's security guards, you know, yeah. everywhere. And I think this is fun. And I, I love dogs. And they come straight towards me and I'm still not feeling intimidated. And then they surround me and there were like some um, Alsatians and Rottweilers and everything like that. And I still remember, and I really like Alsatians. So I had just sort of extended my hand to right. pet one of the Alsatians going forward, not realizing that I backed into a Rottweiler who promptly jumped up and bit me on the bum. <laughs> like literally attached himself to my bum. And it was just one of those moments like, I, this has this actually happened yeah 
And I was too much in shock. And fortunately, you know, Anu, uh, again, this is why maybe I, I also define myself as a writer. There's, there's the me that's involved in this okay, action. But there's you're the, observing it too. And then there's the me that the, the, yes. was watching it third person yeah. happen. Like, this is bizarre. What is going on right. here? Fortunately, it wasn't a very bad wound. He right. just kind of jumped up and gave me a love bite. Huh. But I screamed. Of course. The dog scattered. There was complete chaos. You know, the, the, the security guard cleared them away. Huh. And uh, Maureen, you know, like dropped everything and, you know, was, you know, extremely, uh, you know, also thrown off and promptly kind of escorted me into the house and promptly pulled my pants down and like attended to the wound. Right. But this was a very strange and surreal beginning and introduction, you might say. So we never talked about anything we were supposed to talk about. Right. I come as sort of, I guess, as a go-see and we were chatting, but she was extremely warm. Yeah. She was very chatty. There was something very magnetic about her. But of course, it was also deeply embarrassing that your first meeting with this very distinguished looking woman is her <laughs> jerking down your pants and like making sure that you don't need stitches, <laughs> basically. <laughs> But she was extremely, she had the staff around me, you know, there was n no great harm was done. Right. And uh, so, you know, I had a band-aid and I was, you know, promptly sent home. I still remember that Glad Rags cover. You do? The, it was you <laughs> and Karan. Yes, yeah. Uh, what was the color of the towels? Red? Oh. Was it red? No. Okay, the first Glad Rags cover that launched me was a red bathing suit. I remember suit. red. Yeah, yes. I remember red. Right. It was this red, it was a bathing suit. Ba yeah, Baywatch style bathing suit. <laughs> Darren and I did ads later for you Bombay Dying. You did ads, right? Yes, remember, for Bombay Dying. Yeah, I remember yeah. those. And, and I remember the sort of electricity of that. Nobody had right. seen anybody like you it before. Was, it was bizarre, incredible. isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> no, but it was incredible. And then, so did you not do films just because you didn't feel at home? It, it, was it too much of a culture shock? Yeah, it wasn't a culture shock because I felt strangely at No, home meaning in within the industry. Within the, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it was. Did, I felt very uncomfortable, the industry and, the, you know, sort of the, I, yeah, everything about the industry at that time felt very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And it, as I said, amongst ourselves in the advertising, it was just something that we didn't aspire to. Right. Occasionally we looked down upon. I still enjoyed my Govinda films and really, you know, relished again his films and his mm. songs were playing in my car, you know, on the way to shoots, but I did not see myself gyrating with him. Yeah. No. Um, and it was also a very strange era. I mean, the 90s was the era of the underworld getting involved also yeah. in films, you know, and there were a lot of people. It was people. scary. It was scary. It, it was, was genuinely, genuinely yeah. scary yeah. for a lot of people and yeah. a lot of very well established people and even not established, very well established people. And I don't think I'm giving away anything by saying it's not a rumor that, for instance, if you were involved in a film and you got a phone call right. from Bhai, you would have to go and dance at a wedding and sure. you know yeah, um, yeah, yeah. you know do yeah. a favor nothing yeah. again you know tear crossing the line but right. you were at the mercy of Absolutely. other forces yeah. were telling you what to do and where to go and imagine someone like me who was so fiercely independent i think if anything what i fought for my entire life is just my way of doing things mm. my freedom and my independence and you know the liberty to do things good or bad right. on my own terms so i yeah. could not imagine tying myself you know, or becoming beholden to mm. the system. It was a very, very intricate kind of a web, yeah. you know, and you almost didn't know exactly what was going on. Mm. So I honestly felt very uncomfortable with that. I didn't judge anyone else who was in it at all. Sure. And then later, of course, I did end up going and doing a film and I had also a lot of uh, friends yeah. in the film industry. I don't like going around saying it, but I'm here since that time. You know, I've seen Shah Rukh since that time. Yeah. I've seen yeah. Salman since that time. Um, so, you know, and it was a small, tight group of people. Yeah. You know, this little band of crowd. Tiny. <laughs> yeah. It was very tiny. Yeah. And we all yeah. sort of knew each other just, you know, yeah. that way. Like yeah. we were all acquaintances. And it was also no big deal because they were also building the film industry at right. that time. Right. Right. You know, but Lisa, you did Kasoor in 2001, 
Um, and it's, you know, I found an interview I did with you oh then God. for India Today magazine. Are you serious? Uh, yes. And I was, I was, uh, thanks to the internet. You yeah. Oh anything. my God. Okay. Everything so comes back to haunt you. Comes back. So, so, you know, and you said it was so interesting. I said, but why this film? And you said that uh, uh, this is the one where I feel like my sensibility connects. Right. Uh, um, and Good. at that time, sure, uh, you know, you found whatever you did in, in Kasur. But after that, why did... the hindi film industry not become whole as a number of complex reasons actually which i go into in the book there was a very complex situation also in my personal life which i've been very frank about in the book again there was something stopping me so i have you know i i can be a very rational person as well i consider myself a fairly smart person but then on a deeper level i think that the wisest part of me is that is my gut And listening to that gut is not something we're always taught to do. I don't know why I can't explain it why, but my gut has always come through and led me in certain ways. And I just listened to my gut because as I said, I'm obviously a very stubborn person. I'm a very determined person. Um, you know, to sure enough come at 16 and you know all alone not know anyone and still kind of make my own little corner here in Bombay. Ha- took a lot of determination yeah, yeah, and you know and hutspah. but something was holding me back and perhaps the way i have of describing it today is it was a part of myself maybe the watcher the writer standing apart from myself and saying this is not your path right. if you actually consent to do this as in really go in and you have to in hindi films you have sure. to give yourself you yeah. have to give your blood you have to be committed yeah, yeah. you can't do it half heartedly it's too hard it's too hard yeah, it's yeah. too long it's too there's too many sacrifices that yeah. you have to make some part of myself would have been extinguished mm. and the one part of myself that i needed to become who i am today and maybe to become the writer that hopefully i will become you know um i know that i know that for a fact because also i need my space if i'm also around too many people or um pressured to act a certain way and to put on a mask and listen it's all about masks of course you know and i'm not saying that with any form of judgment right because right. what i like saying about this book close to the bone is it's about me letting go of my own masks and that journey has taken me a long time yeah but we all have to wear masks and the industry also demands of a lot of masks probably more masks sure. today than back then yeah. but you have to smile and you have to be nice to the right people and you have to you know consent to going out for dinners and socializing it's not me right if i did that relentlessly i really i don't know how to explain it i choke i feel suffocated mm-hmm. and even with my modeling i would feel very suffocated mm-hmm. because at that time i was so in demand i was working every day and i would not give myself a break i didn't know how to regulate myself so i would just suddenly then one day i would not be able to get out of bed and i would just stop picking up my phone i would not show up for the shoot and i would just barricade myself in my house and i think that that's sort of a big part of my journey and my struggle in the 90s you know where i had absolutely i know look i had it all laid out for me absolutely If I wanted to take that path, I could have easily become, you know, a Bollywood star at that yeah, you time. You're sensational. You know, there's no getting away from that. Yeah. But it was not for me. It's not who it's it's not my path in this life. Although it has played a very important role in my life and I'm very thankful to it. I'm mm. sitting here today. And today I think I am in control of it. It's not controlling me. Right. I think in those days I I wouldn't have been able to control it. Correct. It would have eaten me up. Yeah. For better or for worse. But Lisa, here's what I find so fascinating that that you've seen um in one life two such extremes, you know, mm-hmm. your beauty is so celebrated. You're flown across the world to push product, to uh, you know, to do sure. videos, to do all of that. And from there you go to a place where your body is sort of wrecked by disease, where you're losing your hair. Mm-hmm. How do you make sense of these two? It makes sense of it because you realize that you're not your body entirely. I mean, we identify with this But body. Was that how hard was that to see yourself change? I mean, to see this face that has been just, you know, 
I mean, that Afreen video is, is still so clear in my head. Is it? I, you know, I have to say that this is incredible that Afreen <laughs> constantly comes up. I don't know yeah. how many years later. So yeah. it's, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I think that I had always felt deeply uncomfortable. That's what I've written about in my book, Close to the Bone. Um, I'd always felt deeply uncomfortable with only being recognized by my appearance. It never sat well with me. And that was part of my struggle that I think is also even what led to the, um, the eating disorders because it was anorexia and bulimia of acting out through my body and my appearance. You know, sometimes I would gain weight and I felt very defiant about it. Mm -hmm. So I think that finally here was a situation where I was able to liberate myself from everybody else's idea of who I am. It was very hard for me to negotiate and find that crack of me being able to stand there and say, look, I am not just this. I am right. not who you think I am yeah. entirely. That is one part of me. But here's who I am and here's, who, here's the part of me that I want to share. I want to offer you this part of me as well. And often, I mean, I think I know it's, it's interesting that you say you, you found that old interview because when I was writing the book, I had to also look through old interviews. My parents, bless them, had, had kept it. Yes, yeah, so sweet. Clippings, my yes, God, I don't yes. know what to do with them now. Like I should <laughs> donate them somewhere. Like honestly, old no, no. stardust. Do you have daughters to show them to? Are you joking? But you know, when you look at that, and uh, but the one good thing about that is I said, okay, Hmm. I think I remember this a certain way, but sure enough, I was consistent because right. in every single interview I gave, I was almost begging that journalist to try to see me in a different way, yeah. which is a little sad, mm. actually, you know, mm. but because I was too young, I didn't know. I, I also didn't clearly who, know who I was. So I think that it is something that happens to someone who you can only understand until maybe you're in my shoes, what it's like to be on one hand, overestimated, mm. to be honest, yeah. in terms of my appearance, I feel I've been overestimated. I think we've had this discussion because I don't think I'm a great beauty, but I photograph well. Simple as that. Some people photograph worse. Some people photograph, they look exactly the same right. as they look. I look superb. I look <laughs> dynamic. I look like Marilyn Monroe in front of the camera, but in everyday life, People would just pass you me by, and I've written Lisa. about that. You look I promise good. you, I'm not just saying that. I, but like, I know. So I've been overestimated in one thing, and I've been underestimated right. on the other part of my life. Mm -hmm. Say when it comes to like maybe intellect, and and the other parts. Not not just intellect. Let's say you know the other part of me that I have to offer. Mm -hmm. Right. That has been overshadowed often. Yeah. And that was another reason even why I had to leave India at one point. I had to get out of this bubble because I could have ridden that wave. Mm. And maybe one part of me is just not smart and shrewd enough to do that, you know. And that's okay, you know. I know a lot of people who have, who are extremely smart, but they said, okay, I'm going to work this angle. Right. Fabulous. All power to you. For whatever reason, I couldn't do that. I had to kind of inhabit a place where I feel that I'm in charge of both, you know, where I'm in fully inhabiting both my body and able to inhabit my soul, you know, or my spirit and, and share that mm. from a place that makes sense to me. That's all. So now, Lisa, with this sort of hindsight of 30 years um, and this kind of changes you've seen in mm. the film industry from that little group in Bandra uh, and to now this sort of global brand uh, yeah. and to the pressures that there are on women and I almost feel like I think they're more now because of social media. Yes. You know? <gasps> I, you know, honestly, I don't understand. Hats off to all of the actresses today. Yeah. I don't know how they do it, Anu. I don't know that constant scrutiny. Yeah. I mean, when, where do you have privacy? And then the constant pressure to post, Absolutely. to keep up. Yeah, because that's a job too. That is a job in and of itself. Of course. Like I have to do it in my own little way. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, I so get do it, I. right? So do I. You have it to. Do you find it stressful? It is. It is. Because it is, right? if, if you go for two, three days without posting, you're like, shit, gotta post. And so right? that's something that's that you That's an internal thing. And Absolutely. other people even reminding yeah. you and oh, yeah. you're not relevant and whatever that yeah. means. Oh my God, that's the word. That's, that's the word. <laughs> that is the, what, what, what should we call that word? That's the that's dirty a word. Curse. That's the curse. <laughs> yeah. That is the biggest curse now. It is. Because I call you not relevant. Right. <laughs> not relevant.
<laughs> I mean, what does that even mean? Yeah. Yeah. Relevant to what? Vis-a-vis exactly. -vis what? When things are changing so yeah. much. Yeah. And also, you and I also have the, you know, the wonderful acumen and experience to say that, you know what? There's nothing new. Whatever's right. being done today has been done. Yeah. It's been recycled. So what does that mean being yeah. relevant? Yeah. You know, yeah. does it mean having all these likes? Or? But it's a it's a it's a terrifying place where it's the validation today. comes in from those likes and from and the, instant validation. And it's instant. And and you know, when I speak to actresses, they're talking about just this whole pressure of I come out of a restaurant, I come out of a friend's house, I'm in chapels, it'll be somewhere, it'll be circled. Oh, she's having a bad day. Oh, she repeated mm -hmm. her outfits. You know. Given your experience and given your vantage point, what would your advice be? How should women, and not just actors, but all women, kind of process this? And how do you move forward? Knowing that you are being judged, you are being examined, mm -hmm. you will have to post, that's, that's the world we all live in. Exactly. You know, exactly. So how do we do it without, again, losing our souls? Without losing our souls. That's a great question, you know. I mean, it's something that even I at times struggle with. Yeah. I mean, I think you just have to make the priority. First of all, I, I would advise taking one day to step away. Yeah. Detox. Detox. <laughs> yes. Detox has, takes on a very different meaning. Yes. It's like put everything in a black box, lock right. it up, put it away, all your electronics. Yeah. Detox. And I think that you do have to take a step away and reflect on, it's, it's, it's the eternal questions, but will always be relevant. Who am I? What do I want? What do I want to put out there in the world? You know, what are my values? I think that today, the one way I have of coping it is saying that, okay, even today when I put on makeup and I, you know, get made up and, you know, look fabulous, but and maybe talking about something that is not related to how I look, I say, but it's all in line with my values. I know what my values are. I know what I want to put out there. Right. So, you know, it still is serving you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I have actually made a list, you know? And I, it's not like I look at it every day. Like an actual yet. physical list? I made a list. I make lists. I'm big on lists. Okay. You have to write it out. You can't keep it in your head. I guess you can put it on your notes. <laughs> but it's, I don't know, it's like, I'm that generation. I need to write it out. Okay. I need to like actually, what is you the know? List? The list is your values. The list is just say, this is what is important to me. You know, how whatever comes out of it. What is important to me? How do I want to be known? Put a list of like, this is what's important and then this is what's not important. Like actually see them side by side and seeing them side by side will at least break that spell because otherwise everything is like, we're consuming so much information, opinions, white noise, blah, yeah. blah, 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 babble. So you have to like quiet everything, cut everything off and make your own list. Mm. I really find that helpful. I really know that everything is in service of my list and my things. Right. Part of it is also humor. Part of it is also irony. You know, it's okay. We have to laugh at ourselves. Yeah. The other thing, of course, is a strong support system. Yeah. You got to find a couple of buddies who get you. They just get you so that, you know, you can laugh this crap off. Right, right. You know, and you can say, yeah, I do have a muffin top. You know, I mean, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I mean, and you can see it very clearly. And, you know, it's, it's, it's okay, right, right? right? Also, sense of humor comes in really handy I think these so. days, yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. But, and also on the days when it's like, you can't find your way out of that hole, chocolate. <laughs> No, chocolate works really well. Seriously. When all else fails. When all else fails, <laughs> I've got my like one little stash with me. <laughs> okay. Finally, tell me, Lisa, now that you're back in Mumbai, yeah. and I know you have the book tour and you, you have all of that around the book. Yeah. But after that, what are the plans? What do you want to do? Well, I do have a certain amount of work coming up right yeah. now. Mm -hmm. um, Anything I'm, you can tell us about? I can share that I have a, a film releasing um, nice. called 99 Songs, right. which is A.R. Rahman's first of course. production. He's written the, the film and I'm uber excited about it, of course. But so excited, actually. I, don't, like, I need to see it. I need to see it. So I think that's releasing in June. So that's going to be exciting to do some promotions around that. I go into shooting another season of my Amazon series. Four and more shots. Yes. Yeah, nice. And uh, so we're pretty excited about that. After that, to be honest, Anu, um, I'm taking it step by step, you know. I've always kept busy with also giving a lot of motivational talks and things like that. But right now the book 
is my big baby and I, I'm feeling a lot of anxiety about it. Why? Um, it's so personal, it you know, personal. and it but really which is, is why it's valuable because it is personal. I hope so. Yeah. I, I, um, I see it as a writing debut as well. And I hope to, of course, be writing a lot more off of that. And I don't know. I have in the back of my mind maybe an idea that it might become a Netflix series eventually. I'm going to say it because I'm going to put it out there. Right. I think there, there might be something in it. And if not that, then something else. So I do want to get into writing more. Yeah. And let's see. Let's see where the path takes me now. And of course, I've got my babies. They're gorgeous. I've got my baby, so I got my hands full. I'm just happy to be back. Yeah. And of course, I, you know, you've read the book, I Never Plan Anything. Right. And the best things that have happened to me have always sort of just fallen into my lap. So let's see what falls into my lap next. And hopefully no dogs will bite. <laughs> hopefully no dogs. <laughs> and I have a bigger bum now as well. So it'd be like I'm a big target now. I had a small bum, yeah. Now I have a big bum. <laughs> Thank you. It's always Thank so much you. fun to speak to you. I Thank always you. love this, Anu, and I love catching up with you, and I love our chats. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so if you like this interview, please like, share, subscribe to Film Companion. <laughs>